Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel, the director of the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm your host today for the webinar series that we do with our friends at Open Channels and Octo, EDM Tools Network. So we're really happy you can join us today. This one is particularly close to my heart since uh, Dr. Charlie Wally, a close colleague and great friend, is going to be talking today about the MPA Center turning 20. And the title of his talk is Two Decades of Understanding, Strengthening, and Connecting Marine Protected Areas. So um, I will turn it over to Charlie here in just a moment. But first, I just want to remind you to please go ahead and ask your questions, either in the question box or the chat box. Charlie will give his presentation. And when he's done, we will come back and facilitate the Q&A with all of you. And I'm sure you'll have lots of, of questions to ask. So we look forward to that part of the discussion. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Charlie and then turn it over to him. Uh, Charlie Wally is the senior scientist at NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, which he helped found in the year 2000. He's a marine ecologist with nearly three decades experience in ocean management and works to catalyze and interpret cutting edge science that drives effective ocean conservation. Previously, Charlie led the science education and conservation programs for NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries and National Estuarine Research Reserve Systems. And before he joined NOAA, he directed and taught marine ecology at Lehigh University's Stone Harbor Marine Lab on the Jersey Shore and conducted field research in coral reef ecology throughout the Caribbean. Charlie earned a PhD in ecology and evolution from Johns Hopkins University and a BA in aquatic biology from UC Santa Barbara. He is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he has re received three NOAA bronze medals for his work in ocean conservation. And I also just want to note that Charlie will be retiring next month after a 29 year career at NOAA and he will be greatly missed. But that may influence his uh, uh, willingness to, to answer all your questions in, in his typical candid way. So I'm turning it over to you, Charlie. Well, thank you, Lauren. And thank all of you for joining us. <clears throat> yeah, I've thought about that retirement issue in relation to my answers to questions. and. I'll try to find the middle ground that allows me to stay employed for the next two. So today, uh, Charlie, Charlie, your uh, audio frequently is the we because it's really. Charlie, your audio is a little. Uh, okay, patchy. is this better? Yes. <clears throat> I don't know what that's from, but we'll give it a try. So. Um, of Charlie, where the MBA Center losing. came from and where we've. Charlie, we're losing you again. It's uh, I think I'm it's not sure why your audio is coming in and out. Hi, Charlie. Um, if you you could also t do you have a phone handy? Or do you have any ideas? Uh, Charlie, do you have a phone yeah. handy? Okay, then you could also call in. Um, yes. Let me, let's see. Easiest way to do it. If you go to the all you have right. the audio panel for the user interface. Um, let's see. I think you can. It's been so long since I've uh, dealt with that. Um, you can switch to phone call there, and it'll give you a number to call in. Okay. Where do I? S okay. Where Under do audio? I see the number? Yeah. Um, in the the audio panel of the user interface, uh, there's a radio. An option for computer audio, phone call, or no audio. If you switch to phone call, it'll show some call in numbers and you can call in. Got it. Okay. All right. Sorry, about, sorry everyone. We'll, we'll get started in just a minute when Charlie's able to call in. Lauren, are there any updates from the center? <laughs> we well, actually, we thanks for sort of giving me this option. I will just let people know that we do have a brand new um, video to celebrate our 20th anniversary, and we'll be sharing that in our newsletter, but it's on our web page, and there's a link on the front page of our website, which is marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov, and we also have a web story about the history of the NPA Center that Charlie authored, um, so you can, you can also refer to those. Um, and I would just note that next month, um, for Oceans Month, we are going to be publishing a report on how the U.S. is doing with respect to achieving uh, conservation goals and building MPA networks. So look for that in the next couple of weeks. 
Okay, great. And I don't know if Charlie can hear us, but you'll need to enter a PIN number, Charlie, in order to be able to uh, be unmuted. So it should show. Yeah. Oh, yep, there can you, you are. Me? All right, great. Yep, we sure can. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I don't know what that's about. So um, do I need to start at the beginning? Um, yeah, please do. Yes, please. Okay. So thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Um, and to all of you for joining us. Sorry about the little technical interruption. Um, today, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of the history of the MPA Center and uh, a glimpse into its hopeful future in the next 20 years. Um, we've come a long way. We've done a lot of things and learned a lot of lessons, and I think some of them are worth sharing. Uh, so to start with, I think all of you probably know, or uh, you wouldn't be here, that our ocean provides us with a lot of value, with benefits, services, and it supports our livelihoods and our spirits and, and our recreation and all kinds of things that mean different things to different people, but they're all important. And we in order to sustain those benefits, we have been using MPAs, Marine Protected Areas, for over a century in, in this country to um, conserve important places and the services they provide to coastal communities and other users. And MPAs in the U.S. can be found really virtually everywhere. Um, they're common in coral reef environments like this one, in temperate coastal environments like this, which was off of the Washington coast. And they're also used, uh, not as frequently, but increasingly to conserve cultural resources and more broadly cultural heritage in some of those same areas. And it's a, it's a very powerful tool, it's a proven tool but it's not without its uh, complexities and sometimes controversy. And that has driven a lot of what we do. And that's going to be the topic of discussion today. So with that as background, um, in the say mid nineties up until the, the around mid 2000s, there was a growing interest worldwide and, and certainly in the US for more and stronger MPAs. And that was driven by a, a widespread desire to conserve biologically important areas, to reduce the impacts of fishing in those areas, to have uh, at least some, if not all of those areas be no-take reserves where all forms of, of extraction, primarily fishing, of course, are restricted or prohibited, and for the sites to be uh, incorporated into integrated networks of ecologically connected MPAs. And that, that was, in, in effect, the, the drumbeat, if you will, in the, around the turn of the century, which always seems strange to say. But, uh, and in that context, several things started to happen. Um, one was that, not surprisingly, various stakeholders of ocean interests began to be concerned about how that, that initiative might play out. And in particular, in the U.S., there were uh, very um, serious and, and at least founded questions about some of the core principles of, of MPAs and MPA networks. For example, what's the rationale and need for an MPA at all? Uh, it, was, it was very common in the past really two decades for people who were concerned about MPAs to say it's a solution in search of a problem. For you know, every hammer, everything looks like a nail to a hammer. So there, there were, persistent questions about why do we need these things, especially in particular areas that were of interest to particular groups. 
uh, related to that, there was a lot of concern and confusion and misinterpretation of what the purpose and the definition of a marine protected area really is. And that was for a good reason is that it, was, it has always been vague and confusing and it's getting better, but it still has a way to go. There was a lot of angst, not surprisingly, over the uh, the question of well, how much protection do we need in any given MPA? Is it, does it have to be no take or can it have some sort of provisions for allowing certain kinds of activities like say, for example, pelagic fishing or you know, catch and release fishing that allow some of the pre-existing activities to continue. There was a chronic uh, cry for evidence of effectiveness. And, and in effect, the, the challenge was prove to me that these things work so that we can justify making the sacrifices they require to set them up. And as many of you probably know, that that's not a trivial exercise to prove that. There was a lot of concern, um, sometimes rightly, over the the way in which MPAs have been, had been designated and the process and the degree to which it, it was science-based and inclusive and open and transparent. And then related to that, there were uh, strong concerns within the indigenous communities in the U.S. about whether their uh, rights and and uh, relationships to the areas and even their very existence had been taken into account appropriately. Usually the answer was no. And then there was a there was a growing concern of over the the grand plan about all these MPAs. You know, the, the drumbeat was we want more. And the response was, okay, what's the plan and where do you want them and when will you know you've had enough? So within this context, there was there were uh, over expressions of stakeholder concern. These two images, three actually, but the bottom two were taken um, during the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary uh, Management Plan designation process back in the 90s. And they they illustrate a couple of things. Um, some are in those bulleted lists about concerns or confusion over the nature of the protection and what's allowed and what isn't. And it also illustrates the strength of concern and opposition uh, among some key stakeholder groups. So at this point, a rational person looking at this situation might think, I think I'm going to go work on something else. Uh, and m many did, uh, but it turns out that a handful of people saw this as, as a problem needing to be fixed. And specifically, the, the aspects of the, the problem were those bulleted points, the rationale, the purpose, the level, the effectiveness, the process, the indigenous connection, and the overall plan. And so what, what I'd like you to do, if you can, is kind of keep those in your mind as we go through the MPA Center's evolution and focus, because they've been the driver of a lot of what we've done. Um, so given all this angst and, and it was it was pretty intense and, and it was I think justifiable in many cases there was um, a response and what that looked like was the president Clinton signed an executive order on uh, Memorial Day in 2000 that was intended to address some of those concerns in a way that would let, allow us to more effectively use MPAs within the nation's system of marine protected areas to achieve cultural, uh, you know, the, the conservation of natural and cultural resources for this and future generations. And that executive order, which is, still exists, told NOAA and the Department of Interior to do six things. Um, 
And just for those of you who, who may not know, executive orders are instruments by which the president of the United States directs federal agencies to do certain things. It doesn't have the force of law and, it's, and it, it can be undone by another executive order. So it's sort of a, a transitory state of being, but many of them persist for a long, long time. So this EO told Noah to do the following, to strengthen and expand the nation's system of MPAs, to maintain the comprehensive inventory of all US MPAs, which I'll give you a little hint, it sounds simple, but it was not, uh, to maintain a website with public information about MPAs, which would include the inventory as well, to engage stakeholders through the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee, to partner with other federal and state territorial and tribal agencies to do the above, and to create the National MPA Center within NOAA to uh, support and accomplish those, those directives. So we, we did that. Um, this is a brief summary of, of the kind of administrative history of the center, if you will. And it's not very interesting, but it, it wouldn't seem complete without it. So the origin of the idea was conceived actually within the Marine Sanctuary Program as an internal think tank for MPA issues that related to sanctuaries back in 98. <clears throat> the center was established by the executive order by NOAA in 2000. The Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee was established in 2003 and recently terminated by another executive order in 2019. And we've had two directors, Joe Urovich at the beginning until 2010, and Lauren Wenzel from 2010 to hopefully a very long time. <clears throat> We're within NOAA, we're located within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which is where we came from originally. Our physical locations are in NOAA headquarters in Silver Spring and in Monterey, California, where I and Mimi Diorio work. Our funding level has varied widely over the years, um, but it averages somewhere around one to two million with periodic ex external support through grants or contracts or what have you. <clears throat> and their staffing is also variable, but it ranges somewhere between four to 10, including a handful of FDEs and then fellows and interns and detailees and other people we can Shanghai into helping us out. So what, what all that says is we're a small group and we're, really focused on uh, leveraging other uh, programs, capabilities and interests and sometimes money to do big things. So what I'd like to talk about now is, is what those things, some of those things have been. <clears throat> and for the purposes of this historical uh, retrospective, there are three fa main focal areas that the center has has prioritized its work since 2000. Uh, the first is understanding MPAs. The second is recognizing the human dimension, that's us. And the third is building resilience among MPAs. And these are almost sequential, but there's some considerable overlap among them. And you can think of them as running in parallel, but starting at three different times. <clears throat> and what I want to give to you is a for each of those three, a brief summary of some illustrative examples. And then for each of those three, a deep dive in one or two of those projects to give you a better sense for not just what the project is, but how we set our priorities, how we choose what we work on and how we actually work. So the first one, which was the beginning of what, when we started is about just understanding what this MPA thing is all about. And that gets back to that hanging an effigy um, slide, which basically in a nutshell is 
you could say that it all stems from uh, misunderstandings about what MPAs are, what they're for, what their benefits are, and, and what their costs are. And so we set out to, to try to solve that a little bit. You, you can't necessarily solve the conflict, but you can solve the misunderstanding. And so we have, uh, working with some partners in, in elsewhere at NOAA, we developed um, basically uh, education modules, like a, one was an MPA 101 course. And, and it gave people just the basics, you know, what is it? How do they get made? What do they include, et cetera? And we offered that widely, and, and, and it seemed to be successful in beginning to chip away at this confusion about what an MPA really is. We also saw uh, that there was s some serious dissatisfaction about uh, designation processes for MPAs. And of course, that always exists, especially for among groups who had to give something up. But we thought there might be some lessons that could be learned from looking more closely at what worked and what didn't work. And so we did an analysis of, of the designations, recent designations up to that period, which if I remember right, was about 2005, and, and provided some recommendations you know, to, the, to everyone about best practices for the kinds of things that one could do to make a designation process more successful. Uh, and, and many of those have subsequently become incorporated into the DNA of MPA designations. It's not that we necessarily made that happen, but we, we informed the discussion in a way that I think improved the outcome. Um, the third piece of understanding MPAs is, is a fairly new one. And in some ways, it might be one of the most important things we've done. And that has to do with the who part of MPAs and specifically with indigenous people. Uh, and in the US, we, we have indigenous communities scattered really everywhere. They've been living on and interacting with the ocean in very complex ways for millennia. And I think, although it's a bit of a generalization, I think it's fair to say that until fairly recently, MPA processes and ocean conservation in general have not fully incorporated those communities and their uh, legal rights and, and um, authorities and their culture into the designation and management process. So we uh, set out to try to improve that a little bit and working with our MPA Federal Advisory Committee have done a number of things, but the most recent was to uh, develop what we call the Cultural Heritage Toolkit, which is online on our website, which provides a lot of really useful and really detailed information about um, cultural heritage, uh, the management of cultural heritage, the legal basis for some of those things, best practices about how to do it well, and how to take into account climate change impacts on cultural resources and, and the heritage aspects of a place. Uh, so that that's, um, we think, one of our, our most enduring accomplishments, I think. So now, now I want to do the deep dive part on two pieces of understanding MPAs. And one is just finding a way to talk about them rationally. That, that whole hanging in effigy string of, of woes stems from everyone's inability to use the same terms to talk about MPAs. And if you're already in a discussion about something controversial where inherently there are winners and losers, it, it would be helpful to be able to be talking about the same thing in the same way. So you can at least begin to understand where the, the disagreement is rather than argue about terms that are not really relevant. And there were 
I don't know, at least a decade spent arguing about things that were not real. <clears throat> so we set out to, to to figure out a way to make it a little more uh, feasible to have an objective conversation about MPAs. And the way we did that was to break the, the definition, if you will, the discussion of an MPA down into uh, functional criteria that can be objectively ab assessed and discussed. And so for any MPA, we, we could identify its conservation focus. The icon on the top right is a cultural heritage MPA. The others were uh, conservation, natural heritage and sustainable production. Each MPA has a specific level of protection that the icon down below has is for zoned multiple use MPAs, which it implies visually that you can do a bunch of things, but in different parts of the MPA. Each MPA has a level of permanence. Most of us tend to think and assume that they're there forever, but in fact, many are not. Some have a finite duration and they're intended to be removed at the end of that. Some more commonly have a basically a sunset provision at which time the MPA's effectiveness or other criteria have to be evaluated in order to continue it. And the constancy of protection is, it relates to whether the MPA is in force all the time. And a, a simple example of that would be a seasonal fisheries-based MPA, say for a spawning aggregation area, where you want the protection in that place when the fish are there in huge numbers doing a critically important ecological process, but then maybe that's not important later on. So it's not constant. And then the scale of protection has to do with whether the MPA is intended to protect everything in that place all the animals, all the plants, all the minerals, everything, or whether it, it's focused on some focal resource, like say an oyster bed or a kelp bed. And that's, that's critically important to understand when you get into discussions about what, what are the nature of protections, because they, they map straight to the scale of protection. So we, we did that and We've used it a lot, others have used it, and, and one of the main things we used it for was to provide the framework for our MPA inventory. And that was one of the tasks that the executive order told us to do. And it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool, uh, thanks largely to our GIS manager, uh, Mimi Diorio, who's here in Monterey with me who's built it into an, an amazing thing that you can do much more than we ever imagined with. And it's a, it's a comprehensive geospatial database of all the MPAs meeting our definition within US waters. And it includes the numbers constantly changing, but say are roughly 1500 MPAs. The data are, deri are derived from the sites or from MPA programs and put into a standard format. And from that, you can do all kinds of analyses. For example, <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, the most obvious is, is spatial maps of where are they? And that's often what people want to know, but you can also look at what's going on with this tool. And for example, if you look at uh, the question of where are different kinds of MPAs, the, and, and you look at the natural heritage and cultural heritage sites, you can see that a large number of them have a terrestrial component. Many of those are fish and wildlife refuges or state sites of one kind or another. And then similarly large piece are coastal and then relatively fewer are offshore. But interestingly, when you look at the area of those same sites in that same perspective, you, you see that, that the differences are accentuated. So the terrestrial sites are a relatively small area. The coastal sites are huge and the offshore sites are somewhere in between. So this, this distinction between number of MPAs and area of MPAs 
is is critically important and you'll see when you play with the inventory that it comes up again and again in ways that are sometimes surprising. So for example, in who manages the MPAs, the states have the overwhelming uh, superiority in the number of MPAs, but the feds have the greatest territory. And then partnerships between feds and states have another very large number and basically that's that's the majority of it so so again number and area are two very different animals when it comes to mpa so when you think about how that relates to governance it's it's really significant and then finally an example of what you can do with it with the inventory is a fairly simple question how long have they been around and you can see that in numbers there's kind of a steady uh, increase from before 1960 to 2012-ish when this graph ends. But in area, it tells a very different story and there's some interesting reasons for that. The, the graph kind of goes along at a plateau and it jumps up around 1980 and jumps up again in the 90s and then it just goes through the roof at roughly 2006. And then again in 2012, and those two represent the, the establishment of two very large MPAs in the in the Pacific Islands. And so you you can see from this that if you're just counting MPAs, it looks like we're on a steady climb, you know, to more. If you're thinking about area and the consequences of that area, you can see that the most recent era has seen the greatest change. And that, of course, if you're interested, if you're in one of those areas, it has great significance to you. So, so the inventory has, has been an incredibly powerful tool, and, and I urge you to get in there and play with it, and to contact me and see uh, the the full range of products and services that it can provide. Uh, so the next theme has to do with us, basically, and, and that's to recognize the human condition of MPAs. And going again back to that hanging slide, many of those bullets have to do with how MPAs relate to people and vice versa, and particularly how the restrictions of an MPA might affect the people that were using it in different ways formerly. And that's, that's, a very complex and just fundamentally important issue that has until fairly recently has been relatively unexplored in, in the MPA community in, in any kind of useful way. And so we, we set out to see what we could do about making that a little more um, scientific and a little more transparent. So we again developed a common language this time of ocean uses that described all the common uses in a way that was functional and would allow people to discuss them knowing that they were talking about the same thing. And that sounds kind of trivial, but in fact, when you think about ocean uses, like say fishing, there, there's a thousand different flavors of fishing and different purposes for doing it and different communities and different impacts. And so when you want to talk about all those things, you want to make sure you know what you mean by fishing. So we developed that product and, and distributed it to, for people to use. We also uh, were noticing, as everyone knows, that there, there's been a huge increase in the rate of, um, or the, the, uh, the level of use of MPAs and, and, and other coastal areas for ocean recreation, and particularly in the past decade. And there are more people doing it and, and, and in new ways every day. And so we worked with our advisory committee to look into that and, and come up with some best practices for MPA managers and programs to begin to address the, the challenges that that use presents and also some of the opportunities as well. And so they, in conjunction with the Marine Sanctuary Advisory Councils, 
developed uh, a set of recommendations which they submitted to NOAA and the Department of Interior and then to the, their own councils to help people have a better uh, chance of sustainably managing responsible recreation. So now, now I, I want to turn to two other um, illustrative examples of how we address the human dimension problem. And one has to do with knowledge and the other has to do with um, evidence or data, really. So the first was, it, it became pretty clear that um, there, there were huge gaps in our collective understanding of how people relate to the ocean, how they use it, how they're affected by it, what they care about, why they care about it. It was just a black box, you know, not universally, but it was not, uh, there was not good enough evidence for good decisions to be made all the time. So we thought, we would start by saying, what, what do we need to know? So we uh, set out to develop social science strategies with expert workshops from people drawn from both academia and the government and the key sectors from around the country. And, and they developed a national research strategy, which you see on the screen, as well as four regional priorities on, on this question of what are the research priorities for understanding the human dimension. And those uh, products informed future research. Importantly, they highlighted the importance of the human dimension of MPAs at a time when that was sorely needed. Uh, the process engaged diverse constituencies in, in some very interesting ways, and I think in ways that made them <clears throat> more willing to buy in or at least participate in MPA processes. It encouraged hiring of social scientists by agencies and, and academia. And it strengthened in some ways the social science community around these, these common areas of inquiry. Um, so that, that product is available on our website, all five of them actually. And, and we think that it, it had a significant impact on, on how we, we uh, approach this question of the human dimension and what we need to know about it. So the next piece of the human dimension, which is, has been my uh, sort of focus for quite a while and in Mimi's as well, has to do with, with where people use the ocean and how, and a little bit with why. And in order to do that, we, we had to design a process that could reasonably and quickly fill a huge data gap in that kind of information. There, there was and still is in many ways a dearth of, of useful, consistent, comparable information about the spatial patterns of ocean uses on scales that are meaningful. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's difficult, it's expensive, uh, it changes widely as you expand the geographic scale. And so we, we had to come up with a way of, of filling that gap, at least initially, that wasn't expensive and didn't take forever. And what we settled on was a participatory GIS mapping process using some very cool technology that allowed us to bring regional experts in ocean uses together into a room and basically have them map out their <laughs> expert knowledge of where specific uses are occurring uh, in, in real time. And, and that became GIS data showing the, the patterns of ocean use. And that, drove then a, a whole series of custom products and, and capabilities, which we're still expanding on. And it also drew on the, the local knowledge of a really diverse group of, of users and sectors and in ways similar to the social science strategy process, it brought those people together around a 
a more common understanding of what this is all about. Uh, so just briefly, here's the list of uses. You can see there are a lot of them, which is why we have that uh, common language. This is where the process looks, people drawing on the whiteboard up on the screen or on a tablet uh, and a desk. And this is an example of some of the, the products. These are larger scale but of California, showing from left to right paddling commercial fishing with benthic gear and offshore oil and gas. The yellow is what we call the general footprint of the use. And the brown, the dark brown is the dominant use area where most of the use happens most of the time. And there are thousands of ways to, to look at this and Mimi, I'm sure would be happy to share with anyone who wants to look at it. So we did this in a, in a number of states around the US and uh, that, that work has been informative for MPA planning and for broader efforts to consider integrated uh, marine planning uh, on larger scales. So the last piece has to do with um, climate change, basically. And I think we all know that all that other stuff is useful, but the oceans are changing really quickly. And in order for MPAs to continue to be effective, they have to change as well. And so we, working with the FAC, looked at the the needs for adaptive management in a changing ocean and best practices for MPAs to adapt to those needs and produced recommendations to uh, NOAA and the Department of Interior and others on how they can set go about doing that. Um, the FAC also worked on a on a sort of a smaller scale but equally important question of how do you develop resilient MPAs in the Arctic as it is impacted by climate change. And finally, the fact, and we looked at the benefits of MPAs for resilient coastal and coastal communities. And then the last piece of that work, which is going to be sort of a continuing theme of our stuff going forward, has to do with networks of ecologically connected MPAs. And our FAC, uh, led by Dr. Mark Carr from UC Santa Cruz, has developed some really important and interesting contributions from both in science and policy on the role and benefits of MPAs, of connectivity in MPAs. And those have been delivered to and used by Commerce, NOAA, and Interior, and have been used in international forums as well. And, uh, some of the the former fact members, including Mark Carr, are continuing to pursue those themes um, outside of the fact. So it's 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 a very important piece. As most of you know, connectivity has not yet been incorporated into many uh, MPA network designs, and in fact, there aren't that many integrated MPA networks in the country and the world. So this is a major step in making that possible. So what's next? Um, we, we will, in addition to the kind of core functions that we must do, the inventory, the website, et cetera, we will be focusing on three things. One is to continue to connect MPA programs and sites around shared interests and concerns. And that's something we've been doing for a while, but we've been doing a lot more of it recently, and it pays tremendous dividends, um, really without a lot of investment of time and effort. Uh, the second is using those connections to build capacity in the US and abroad for the design and management of MPAs. And that's something that uh, we are actually benefiting from as much as delivering because there are a lot of places in the world where some of these challenges that we're still facing have been successfully addressed using methods and, and approaches that maybe we haven't thought of. And then finally, we'll continue to advance the use of ecologically connected networks and coastal conservation 
um, using some of this information as a as a tool and a catalyst. So looking back on those 20 years, there have been a lot of people and a lot of organizations that have made a big difference in our work. But there are a few who, who deserve special mention. The first is Elliot Norris of the Marine Conservation Institute, formerly the Marine Conservation Biology Institute, who was, you might say, the, the spiritual father of, of the executive order and who, along with um, the Cousteau Society and the White House's Council on Environmental Quality, hosted a workshop that prompted the executive order to come into existence. The next are Roger Griffiths and Michael Weiss, both of NOAA, who uh, worked with me to and, and with Ellen Athis of CEQ to actually write the executive order and to shepherd its development. The Department of Interior has been our partner all along, and uh, we look forward to more of that. Joe Yurovich, who was our first director and frequently and often behind the scenes used his Jedi force skills to uh, convince various powers that this was not the executive order they were seeking to terminate. And then the MPA Center staff, and volunteers and many partners over the years have been obviously been a key role. And I think in some ways, most importantly, the Marine Protected Area Advisory Committee and its 96 former members have probably been as important to what we've done than anything else. They have often conceived of the issues, developed a work plan, and come up with really important and impactful recommendations in, as volunteers. And we were sorry to see them go, and, and we really valued their contributions. So this has been an exercise in looking backwards, which is always interesting. Uh, and, and I think that there, are, there are a few enduring contributions that the center has made. There are probably more, but these are the ones that come to my mind. We've served as a trusted forum, largely through the fact, for diverse interests to come together around really complex issues and often to to resolve them. And that in, in an arena that's full of, was full of contention and distrust, that's really an important thing. We continue to be the authoritative source for NPA information in the U.S., which is also very important. We brought the human dimension, sometimes kicking and screaming, into the NPA arena in a way that I think has been helpful and in a way that will never go backwards. We've honored and supported the role and importance of indigenous communities in NPA design and management which I think was long overdue and, and will have a lasting value both to them and to the country as a whole. And we've connected and built capacity among MPA programs. So, and you can see in the three priorities and in the examples that I've given you that the, there are these through lines of, of approaches and ways of working and roles that have led to these outcomes. And as I, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of um, the end of the Clinton administration, which I just happened to be watching on TV. And, and the president, as he was leaving the White House for the last time, He was walking with one of his senior aides and he put his arm around him and he, and he said, well, I think we did some good. And I think we did some good too. So with that, I thank you for listening and I invite you to engage in the next 20 years. And I'll turn it back over to Lauren and Sarah. 
Charlie, thanks so much. That was a great uh, kind of tour through the history of the MPA Center and just the challenges that MPAs face and, and how we've been trying to address them over the last 20 years. So I'm gonna turn to some of the questions that have come in and I encourage you all to add your questions in the question box and we'll get through as many of them as we can. Uh, so here's one from Brian Baird, who Charlie knows well, uh, is the former chair of the MPA Federal Advisory Committee who notes that the Federal Advisory Committee provided a report uh, on the benefits of marine protected areas and called on the administration to fully support, fund, and maintain these areas. But the next action of the administration was to eliminate the committee. So uh, what happens now? <laughs> well, um, that's a good question. The, the, I mean, the simple answer is that the the committee's recommendations and their statement has been made and it's permanent and it's part of the public record and it will never go away so the the message has been delivered but i think the real question and probably the one you're asking is how does it get enacted and that's a challenge especially in part because the committee doesn't exist so we can't use the committee's uh, gravitas to to sort of leverage those recommendations but I think we can and have been and will continue to uh, advance the themes of the recommendations and you know, it's, it's very hard to predict how that will turn out in part because a lot of the the uh, the needs that are reflected in those kinds of recommendations stem from the lack of resources or lack of time. And so it's going to be a constant challenge to solve those problems. But I think we and, and our, our agency partners heard those recommendations and all the others over all the 16 years the committee was in, in operation. And uh, you know, I think they're taking them seriously. Thanks. So we have two kind of related questions. One is um, asking, uh, does NOAA intend to limit non-fishing impacts to MPAs, noting that what most MPAs restrict is fishing? And another question is, how do we explain why some areas have restrictions that others don't? Why, why do restrictions in MPAs vary so much? Oh, that's interesting. Let me start with this second one, because that might inform the first one. So why are some areas more restrictive than others or different than others? And the, there, there is no simple answer to that, but, but if things are working like they should, the uh, nature of the protections of any given MPA and therefore the level of protection should reflect the, the needs of the area and the threats that it faces. And so if, if the MPA is put in place to conserve all biodiversity of a particular area for you know, forever, then that tends to lead to, or can lead to more restrictions than if, if there are goals that are less uh, broad and less constrained. So it, when the system works as it should, the designation process identifies both the goals of the area and then the, <clears throat> the uses that are compatible with those goals and the uses that are not. And the restrictions should match up with those uses that are not. I think in reality, they don't always work that way and it cuts both ways. Sometimes you see examples of overly restrictive or what seems like overly restrictive MPAs, but that's pretty rare. And more commonly, you see areas that are not restricting things that are clearly threats to their biodiversity. So I think the process needs to work more effectively, but <clears throat> differences in outcome are to be expected. And I think the first question about NOAA's intention First of all, there, um, 
there, there really isn't a NOAA intention in relation to MBAs. We have the Marine Sanctuary Program. We have, we are partners with the states in their MBAs, each of which is different. And so our, our goal in the center is to inform uh, what those programs might, how they might execute their own intentions. And, and again, I think most of the time those are site specific um, goals. So there, there really isn't, to my knowledge, in, in this world we live in, a universal plan to have X number of restrictions. It's just not feasible. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so we have a couple great questions to try to get to. From David Dye, he asks, over the last 10 years, the expectations on what MPAs can deliver have grown a lot to the point where we are now running graduate level university courses. Um, have we hyped this too much and have we built the expectations too high? Um, are, are the expectations commensurate with what can be delivered through MPA management? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, my, my gut feeling is yes. We, but but it's it's a more nuanced answer. So I think um, first of all the the way MPA impacts manifest themselves will vary wildly from ecosystem to ecosystem, and increasingly in today's climate, from you know year to year or two or three years at a time. So. So looking at expectations is a lot more complicated than it used to be. And, and I think that there, it, on the one hand, there's growing evidence that MPAs are effective and they do what they set out to do. On the other hand, I think there is a, a danger in overselling those outcomes in order to win a particular argument. And, and in, in my view, that relates to fisheries impacts. And the, the ecology underlying those systems is incredibly complicated and is changing all the time. And I think we might be better to uh, simultaneously focus, as the question suggested, on how do you measure that stuff and how do you understand it, but at the same time, be a little more um, nuanced about our expectations or at least what we are promising to deliver because it's a very complex system and we don't really understand it as well as we'd like to. So I don't think it's a failing, so but I think it's, it's something we should take into account. So we probably just have time for one more question and I'm going to uh read one from Steve Giddings, who says, Charlie, with regard to doing some good, do you feel that the needle has moved significantly in the past 20 years on the ocean conservation ethic of this country? Or is it just too much to ask when politics is such a dominant driver in the US? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, I think that the, the, the needle, so to speak, has moved a lot. I think that there is a there's a widespread uh, interest among all kinds of people in the ocean and by extension in its conservation. I think the number of people that are more you know, committed and more um, informed about the, what that really means is, is much smaller, but I think that's growing as well. I, I, I think that the, the challenge, in, in, in my view, is is taking the next step and going from that uh, growing support for the oceans into meaningful action in the oceans, and that that's not easy. And 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 I think that gets back to this question of overselling and what's the intention and all the other stuff. But I think we're at a, at a critical point in the evolution of all this work, where we need to leverage the, the goodwill that, that the oceans have generated into effective protection so that they will actually do what we hope they'll do. 
So we have to wrap up. I want to just call out um, and thank two other advisory committee members, Gary Davis and John Ogden, who wrote in questions. And we will try to get back to others who asked questions and didn't get a chance to have them asked. And there will be a recording of today's webinar. Um, and so you can check, you'll be sent a link to that uh, following mm -hmm. this. But I just want to give John Ogden the last word who said, Charlie, many thanks to you, Lauren, and the NOAA staff who have stayed true to the goals originally established with the Florida Keys Sanctuary. I am hopeful that MPAs will lead us to the larger goal of comprehensive management of our coastal ocean. Well done and Godspeed. So Charlie, I just want to thank you um, for a great presentation. I want to thank all of the folks who joined us today. And uh, we will look forward to talking with you at a future webinar. Thanks. Great. Thank you, everybody.